Rachel, welcome back to the podcast. I'm so excited to have you here. And let me just tell you, like your episode is one of the top played episodes like of all time on the show because people are so fascinated by this concept of passive income and like how you were able to retire in your 20s and all this stuff. So y'all, if you haven't tuned into that episode, shame on you. We're going to link that in the episode show notes because you need to get to know Rachel and her incredible story. It's an honor to have you back on the show. So thanks for being here. Well, thank you. I had no idea. That's very exciting. I'm so looking forward to talking to you again, girl. Absolutely. So we have bonded on many levels at this point. And so the reason why I wanted to have you back on the show is because unbeknownst to me, we were actually navigating divorces like around the same time in 2022. And as a fellow entrepreneur, content creator, knowing that there was somebody else that was going through this process, which is just wild in itself. And we're going to dive into kind of how our experiences have been similar in ways and like super different in ways. But it's reminded me that all of these people that we aspire to be or like our follow on social, like we're actual human beings living actual fucking lives besides the content that you see on social media. And it was just an important reminder that I think I needed about, I'm still human in this process and we're still going through shit. And sometimes what's going on in our personal life will affect our business, will affect our money. And it's not necessarily that we should separate those two things, but it's like, how do we extract the lessons that we're learning to provide value to the audiences that we serve? And I think as women who are building empires and who are pursuing financial independence, it's also important to talk about like how marriage and divorce plays into this. And so I couldn't think of somebody better to really talk about this with. Well, thank you. And I agree. For me, when I first separated from my ex-husband back in April... I booked a one-way ticket to Italy and had my eat, pray, love moment. It was lovely. And I couldn't really like legally talk about my divorce until it was finalized for a lot of different reasons. So on my Instagram, people were seeing this solo trip in Italy and Croatia for two weeks and then coming back to the US, like all this really cool stuff and different stuff. But then behind the scenes, I was like crying every night and I was super depressed and I was in therapy and like the hardest thing that had ever gone through was happening So for me, it was such a relief in October once my divorce was finalized to finally be able to open up and talk about it and be like, look, this isn't real life. You know, this is Instagram. Here's what was actually happening. And a lot of people were really appreciative of that and resonated with it a lot too. But I'm curious how your experience was and when you started talking about it. Yeah. So my divorce began in August and it was... Something that I had been contemplating initiating that whole process for the better part of a year, but just things happened that made it like, we're done. There's no saving this at this point. You know, that's one thing that I've also found interesting too, is just talking to women who've also been through this process. You decide to get divorced way sooner than like you actually <laughs> initiate the process. For some people, it's a couple months, some it's a couple years, but it's been interesting to find like that switch happens internally before it actually manifests itself as a physical separation. But For me, I practiced a lot of escapism that first month. And thankfully, I had such a busy ass schedule, like business wise, that I was fucking distracted for the first 30 days. I was surrounded by people. I was in different places. I was in Orlando one week, I was in California the next week. And I didn't have the opportunity to like fall into a pit of despair. (laughs) So I had a delayed reaction and it came in December. Oh, so I spent kind of the last Q4 basically of 2022 just being hella busy, focused on goals. And then every year since I started working for myself, I would take December off. So it was kind of like my gift to myself for just grinding out another year. And lo and behold, when you don't have work as a distraction, you got a lot of free time on your hands to start thinking about your life decisions and all the shit that's going on. And I literally had just like a mental fucking breakdown the entire month of December. I feel like I'm just crawling out of this and we are now talking on the last day of January. So it's been a hard two months, but I'm really grateful for the fact that I have built a business that is pretty much 50% passive that has given me the space to actually like be a human being without having to worry about paying my fucking bills. I'm curious if that's been kind of the same awakening or like enlightenment that you've had about the freedom that we've actually have built for ourselves to grieve. Oh my gosh, 100%. This realization hit me really hard because I couldn't function for like months. And I was like, I would have 
lost my job because I was so depressed and I wouldn't have been able to pay my bills and it would have been hanging over my head. I wouldn't have been able to like escape and run away to Europe. Right. None of that could have happened. And it was this really great epiphany because I realized passive income, although we see people talking about quitting their jobs and traveling the world and whatever, it's actually way more deep than that. It's way more important. And for me, it gave me the power and the freedom to escape and heal and prioritize my mental health over anything else in life without worrying about the money portion of it. And I'm forever grateful that my divorce happened once I reached financial security and had that. Mm, Yeah. It's one of those things that you really don't understand the true power of that freedom that we seek until there are those situations where it's just like, I'm not fucking functional. Just being able to take a step back and not worry about your basic security is such a powerful place to be. If y'all are listening to this and you're just like, well, you know, passive income sounds cool. No, y'all. It's like a matter of life and death sometimes. And yeah, honestly, it really being is. able to walk away from shit that is just like aggravating your fucking life and not having to worry about paying your bills is the ultimate power for me. Totally. I agree. So one of the things that I found really interesting is that the time was similar the logistics behind it have been opposite. So I actually got a post-nuptial agreement right before quitting my job and becoming a full-time entrepreneur. And this was in May of 2021 when I quit. I was in conversations from the beginning of that year with my CFP, just explaining to her what the goal was, making that transition to full-time entrepreneurship, just making sure that kind of everything was in place, things like an estate plan, things like consistent income and all that stuff. And one of the things that she asked me was, did I have a prenup? And I said, no. It was something that had been like been on my mind back in that day when we were talking about getting married. But it just, with all the chaos going on, it just never happened. And we got married in our late 20s, didn't really have much. So it's just like, I didn't know what the hell I was going to end up building now in my 30s. And so she recommended getting a postnuptial agreement. So I had legal insurance through my job. I found out that I could actually get that paid in full, nothing out of pocket, as long as I used an attorney that was in the network. And I talked to my ex-husband about it and I framed it in a way that it wasn't like the traditional, like, I need a prenup because you're just going to try and steal money from me. It was more of just like, well, this is recommended by a financial professional as part of my overall plan to like quit my job and just make sure that you don't have any liabilities for what I'm doing and I don't have any liabilities for what you're doing. And the conversation went very easily, like framing it that way. So when people ask me, like, how did I bring this up? Defer the responsibility to somebody else. Tell them I had a financial consultation and they just think it's a good idea for both of us to protect ourselves and blah, blah. And lo and behold, you know, it ended up coming really in handy because when I was actually going through the divorce, it was really a matter of confirming that everything that we agreed to in this document is still relevant. I ended up having to pay no money out of pocket for my attorney fees and I didn't give up anything. So I kept my retirement accounts. I kept my business. I kept my intellectual property. It was literally, we walked away with what we had in our names And we moved on. And so the process was very quick in that sense that we filed August and it was finalized by November. And a lot of that was just kind of like waiting periods because there's a waiting period in Florida after you actually like file with the courts and doing the financial affidavits and things like that. But I mean, I think about what the alternative could have been and- Which is me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So so let's talk about like, how has your experience differed from mine? Okay. So I have questions for you though, too. We're like both trying to pick each other's brains right now. So my question for you, and I didn't have a prenup and a postnup. I've heard that it's harder for postnups to like stand legally. Was that your experience or it was no problem? It was no problem for me. And I think when people say that it's, if your ex partner can somehow prove coercion or just like Mm. that, they didn't know what they were signing then that's when things can come into question. So the important thing is that both of you should have legal representation in the process, right? Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't feel like a conversation where it's like, if you don't sign this, like, you know, I'm going to threaten you and shit like that. So, and I think it also has a lot to do with like the state that you're operating in for some reason, like Florida's very prenup friendly or postnup friendly from what I understand, talking to attorneys here in places like 
that are community property states, it might be more difficult to facilitate a post-nup just because the differences in how family law operates. But if you're doing it with integrity, if you're doing it with proper legal representation and you're not doing it under in a coercive environment, you shouldn't run into any issues unless your ex becomes vindictive and then starts to be an asshole, basically. <laughs> yeah. And I've heard, to reiterate what you said, for anyone considering a post-nup, obviously consult an attorney about it. But what I have heard is that each of you need your own individual legal representation that you each need to separately pay for. And whoever you hire should like have equal experience, equal knowledge to help it stand up more in court or if it ever gets to that point. I just wanted to ask about that. But you asked about my experience because mine is wildly different, unfortunately for me. I did not have a prenup or postnup. And when I met my ex and we started seriously dating, I thought about it for a second, like even before we got engaged about a prenup. And I was just like, well, neither of us have that much money. We're coming into this marriage with about equal assets. So I was like, it doesn't matter. And that was the wrong thinking. That was the biggest mistake I made because it's not about what you have then. It's about what you might build. Like You don't know if you're going to write books. You don't know if you're going to start a business or start investing in real estate. And if you're the one putting all of your money and all of your effort towards that, you want to make sure that's protected. So I was kind of ashamed and felt guilty for a while that I didn't advocate for myself when I'm a former financial advisor. And this is what I do for a living. And I teach people how to manage their money. But it's one of those things like you don't know until you know. And, and now I share it because I truly think everyone should have a prenup and it would have made my experience go a lot differently. So in terms of my experience, my divorce, unfortunately, was not amicable. I was hoping it would be, but it was not. I didn't want to get attorneys involved, but we had to get attorneys involved. And there were a lot of things that happened. Like, I feel we both hurt each other unintentionally towards the end of our marriage. And I own up to my part in that. And I think the difference is that I just wanted to get out of the marriage. Even though he had hurt me and done things, I just wanted it to be over. But I think the way he saw it is like, oh, well, she hurt me. And now I, he wanted to inflict pain, I guess. He wanted to get back at me, place the blame on me, something like that. And this is all conjecture, right? I can't read his mind. But that's how it felt based on some of the things he did over the next seven months and the way that he treated me. It was really, really, really awful. You know, they say you don't know who you're with until you marry them. And as we know, that's not true. You really don't know someone until you divorce them unfortunately. So that's kind of how my experience went. I, about halfway through, I got an email from my attorney stating that my ex-husband wanted to get my business valued. And that was the worst piece of news for me. This was something that I created on my own. He had nothing to do with. He didn't make an intellectual or financial contribution to my business. And even before I quit my job, I made sure I was completely financially independent and I wasn't relying on his salary. We had all of our rental properties by then. So my half covered all of my expenses and more. So it was really awful to have that happen. And what I didn't realize is the way that the courts look at a business is that it's an asset. Yeah. So if he puts a valuation on my business, then it's sort of another asset on my side of the balance sheet. And it's going to get offset with him having other assets. Maybe I have to buy him out of my business 50% by paying him in cash or giving him another rental property or whatever it was. But the thing that just sucks in my eyes is that he was making a really large salary, like 200K. And I was making a good amount in my business. But because his was a salary, I couldn't go after that the way that he could come after my business because my business was an asset. Mm. So he could get 50% of my business, but I couldn't get anything from his salary or whatever he was making. Wow. And yeah, and I just didn't know that. And a lot of this to me now sounds obvious or sounds naive, but I'm sharing it because somebody listening might not be aware of how that works either. Mm -hmm. See, this is the shit, right? Like when we're told, sold the dream of marriage, it's like the fairy tale, Cinderella, white dress, fancy freaking reception. And like, there's no discussion around the actual legal implications of marriage and divorce, especially when you are a successful woman that is building an empire. We have access to opportunities that previous generations of women did not have. And so as a result, we're building 
amounts of financial wealth that have not previously existed in large numbers in our community. So I'm curious, what was the financial impact for you? Because for me, it was zero. I literally didn't have to pay him anything. And there are so many women who've come up to me since I've started talking about this publicly. And they're just like, how is this possible? Because we don't hear these stories. You always just hear about people's lives getting ruined by divorce. And my mental health has been fucking ruined. But my financial <laughs> situation, gratefully, has not. And so I'm just curious, like, what has that real world financial impact been like for you? It's impacted me in a few ways. First of all, legally, because we were married, he was entitled to 50% of my business, period. And that's the only reason. So keep that in mind. In terms of the cost of my divorce so far, because we're still adding to this, it's cost $54,000. That was the business valuation, appraisals on our real estate. Most of it was attorney's fees, the vast majority of it. We still have costs coming in because we're still using attorneys for some things. We're in the process of selling some of our rentals that we owned together in Kentucky. So it's not quite over, although it's legally finalized. We're just tying up some loose ends. And my ex-husband and I, and I never used to talk about net worth, but I do now. So let's talk about it. So we hit millionaire status combined a few years ago. I don't remember which year. And when we separated, I feel that the mediation was not favorable. I feel it was a little bit unfair and he walked away with more than I thought was the actual 50-50. So anyways, I ended up coming away with about $850,000 of net worth basically. But what's really cool, and that was in October, is that once I had those signed papers from the judge and I could take back control of my life and my finances and my business again, my net worth just skyrocketed again. And I hit millionaire status again as a single woman, age 30, six weeks later, like last month in December. So we're back. Feels much better hitting it alone this time. And I'm very excited. (laughs) Wow. Good for you, girl. I mean, like, it's got to be in one way demoralizing to see all of this work that you've put in, especially as a business owner, and then like having someone else be entitled to it, which I don't think a lot of entrepreneurs understand. Like you're building a business, you're building an asset. And if it's during the marriage, guess what? That's part and parcel with like what is going to be at stake. And so that's something that people need to understand. It is also possible to recover after divorce, especially if you're in a position where you are financially independent. And I love that you mentioned that because that was also a thing for me. Like Even though I was married for nine years, we were together for 16, we never combined our finances. One of the big reasons why is because my ex-husband had terrible credit. He had terrible money management skills. Even to this day, like he owes money to so many different people. And I was like, I don't want to be involved with that. And, you know, there's some people who would say, well, well, like, why the hell would you marry somebody like that? But then it's also like, can we really judge someone's character based on like mistakes that they made in their 20s with their finances? Because let's be honest, we all make stupid mistakes. But what I did realize after a while is like, oh, I don't think this is a mistake. I think this is like an actual character flaw because like once you're past the age of 30 and you're still doing this bullshit, I'm like, there's something else going on here. And the best thing that I can do is to not involve myself with these things. So we never had a joint loan together on a car or we never had joint credit cards and all those things. And I'm grateful for that because obviously that would have made it harder for me to prove in a court of law that like our finances were separate. And that's one thing that my CFP definitely recommended. She's like in this process of getting the post up, please make sure like your accounts are all separate because if they're a bunch of shit commingled, but then you're saying there's a post up, it's going to be very difficult for you to argue that when you walk away, it should just be like very easily visible that that's how you've been operating. Yeah. And I actually made a really big mistake with that. So I would say my top mistakes are not having a prenup and then combining accounts before marriage. So I'll explain that. I'm curious to hear too, after what you feel like your biggest mistake was in your marriage or divorce or finances. I made a big mistake because before we got married, I started combining our accounts. So once we got engaged, I started combining our accounts and I wanted to sort of keep all my accounts. So I added him to mine, not vice versa. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, and then you get married after that, that sort of eliminates your separate assets. So I'll back up for a second. When you get divorced, the courts are going to look at your separate assets and your marital assets. And your separate assets are anything that you came into the marriage with that was just yours. 
So any cars you owned, any bank accounts you had, your retirement accounts, that's all protected. So that's not going to get considered in the divorce. You're going to get to keep that. Anything that happened from the date of marriage on and that you contributed to and that was joint or whatever, that's what's going to get divided, typically 50-50. So the mistake I made is that when I added my ex-husband to my separate accounts before we got married, I no longer had those sort of protected assets. They were now marital assets. I had to split those 50-50 even though it started off just mine. And it wasn't that much. It's really not a big deal in the grand scheme of things. It's just one of those things like, I wish I had known better. I wish I had done things differently. Oh, and then another thing we did is I viewed our retirement accounts as it doesn't matter whose accounts we contribute to because when we retire together, who cares? We're both going to have access to that money. It pains me to say this out loud. Even before our marriage, because we had combined all of our accounts, everything, I was making sure his accounts were maxed out mm -hmm. before mine were maxed out. Before marriage, during the marriage, we were maxing out his HSA, his 401k, his IRA, and I was not doing the same thing to my own accounts the whole time. So when it came time for the divorce, he had like, 260 grand in retirement accounts. And then I had like 60 grand in retirement accounts. There's probably 20 things I could talk about, but I, I just hope people hear that and learn from it. Do not combine your accounts prior to marriage. Oof, that hurts me to hear. And it's just such typical behavior of us women in general. Like we just want to make sure everybody's taken care of before we are taken care of. Like yes. the oxygen mask analogy is so important, y'all. Like please make sure you're good before you start helping everybody else. Because at the end of the day, you never know what people are going to turn into. From my perspective, I don't necessarily feel like I have a lot of like financial mistakes that I made. I think I was operating subconsciously in like, I always got to have a plan B here. But I think for me, a couple of mistakes were first off, just falling victim to the narrative that like, because you've been with somebody for X amount of time, that's just like the next logical step is just to get married. Because when I look back now, like this relationship was dysfunctional from early on. And I get so used to the dysfunction that it's just like, okay, like this is what we do. We reach a certain age, you marry who you're with. And there's no real long-term vision about like, is this person a good partner? Are you going to actually want to build a life with this person? Or are you just comfortable with the situation because you're afraid of being alone? That for me is a big realization. And then also thinking that somebody's going to change, like falling in love with potential versus like the version of the person that you're with and just like accepting that that's who they are. And maybe they're just not the fucking right person for you. That's been a huge lesson for me too, because I think a lot of us women, we fall in love with the potential of who we think someone can be. And then even after we've received confirmation that they're never going to be this person, like you just start holding on to this sliver of hope. Like one day you're just going to wait them out. I'm just going to be patient. And that, that shit's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. I can relate to that so much. And we all hear it. We all hear the phrase, don't fall in love with someone's potential fall in love with who they are. And then for me, it was like, I logically knew that that was a thing, but then I just thought it didn't apply to me or something. I think I was just a little delusional. I didn't see it. So there was a problem that came up really early on in our relationship and engagement. And then we went to therapy and we worked through it. And I was like, great, problem solved. We've improved. Great. And then it didn't come up until a few years later, right before we were going to get a divorce. And I was still having a hard time trying to decide what to do at that point. But because it had been so long, I identified it as a new problem instead of a pattern, instead of a sign that nothing had actually changed. And that's what tripped me up for so long. And I had a conversation with my therapist when I was trying to decide what to do with about my marriage. And she said, well, now that this problem has come up again. This is now a pattern. It's no longer a one-time thing that you thought was resolved. It's a pattern. And I was like, well, what are my options? And she was like, well, now you know it's not going to change. It's a pattern. It's going to keep happening. So your options are get a divorce or accept this and accept it for what it is. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, those are my <laughs> two options. Terrible. <laughs> right. Awful. And of course, it wasn't just this one thing. There was a lot more that led into the decision, but she did very bluntly help me to realize, oh yeah, like I either need to accept this or if it's truly a deal breaker, I need to move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious what factor, if any, your like circle 
plays into your decision. Because I think for me, I got very good at like hiding the issues in my relationship to the point where like everybody thought it was fine until it wasn't. And when I actually like came out and told people like, look, guys, this is what's going on. I'm getting divorced. All of a sudden, everybody was like, oh, my God, we're waiting for this. We hated him anyway. And I'm just like, why did anyone fucking tell me this? Everybody knew. And they were just like waiting for me to wake up. And in one way, I was like pissed because I'm like, you should have spoken up because maybe I would have taken advice faster. But then again, I'm thinking like sometimes you're just so like in tunnel vision. It's like you're trauma bonded. And if you saw your girlfriend going through this or someone you care about, you'd be like, bitch, what are you doing? But because it's you, it's like you can't even see it. (laughs) Yes. Oh, my gosh. That's so true. This is another mistake I made. I think I'll change this in my next relationship. But when my ex-husband first had like a first problem, you're always going to have issues in your marriage and you work through them. But I thought to myself, well, let's keep this between us. I didn't want to constantly like complain to my family about stuff he was doing because if all they heard was the bad stuff, they would start wondering like, why am I married to him? So I wanted to be protective of that and be loyal to our marriage and keep things private for the sake of just strengthening ourselves against, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but not worrying that our families thought we were a bad match or something like that. And I think that was like a really nice, beautiful, naive, loyal thought to have. (laughs) But in reality, it's actually very helpful to get outside perspectives because you're right. You're so close to it. You have tunnel vision. You can't see clearly when something is really not okay or if the way you're being treated is unacceptable. And I think if I had opened up to my family earlier on or friends about stuff, they would have maybe given me some helpful perspective. When it came down to it and I told them what was happening, everyone was utterly shocked because they didn't think anything was wrong the entire time. They had no clue. And so the version of my ex-husband they thought they knew, it wasn't reality. So then it was a struggle for me because then I had to almost like convince them this was the right thing And there was a lot of resistance, like, oh my gosh, how could this be so wrong? And so I had to like tell them everything. And some people were quickly like, oh shit, I had no idea. Get out of there. And then some people just needed more time to process it. So Mm -hmm. ultimately, I think that made it a lot harder on myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things that I think superficially I was stressed out about because as an entrepreneur, we know like it's expensive to work for yourself. Things like benefits are a luxury. I was getting those through my ex-husband and this idea of like, oh fuck, what am I going to do? Like, can I even afford to give myself healthcare? And then I started thinking to myself, am I really going to stay married for like Blue Cross Blue Shield? We're going to do that. (laughs) Is it that serious? I decided the answer was no. We're going to figure this shit out. So I'm curious what that transition now to like you being fully self-employed, not having access to benefits from a partner. Is that something that's been hard for you to navigate or the ecosystem of income that you've built has allowed you to not make that a big issue? It's fine now. I did think about it and I was like, oh yeah, that's going to suck because that's going to be a huge expense. I was also on my ex-husband's health insurance. I'm actually now still on it through Cobra and I'm paying an exorbitant amount. I'm paying like $760 a month. It's insane. So I'm going to eventually find another solution. But to your point, when you made that decision and you were like, oh, I'm not going to not get divorced because I can just pay it. I thought the same thing because there was a time when I was just on another therapy call and I was thinking about the fact that he was coming after my business. And I was like, I could just stay. I could just stay in the marriage, keep my business and blah, blah, blah. And I said it out of frustration. I didn't mean it, but it was like this realization I had that if that's how I felt with the level of wealth I had, what do women who aren't financially independent or who are living paycheck to paycheck How do they feel when they realize, oh, if I get divorced, I now have to spend another $500 a month on my own health insurance if they're self-employed? Like, Those are the things that started running through my head. And I got like really upset about it because, again, if I messed up this bad, what does it mean for everybody else? So I feel so grateful that financially I can walk away with confidence. And I feel so devastated for probably the majority of people who don't feel that way. And that's why you and I are having this conversation so people can improve their finances and never feel trapped in a toxic or unhealthy marriage. Absolutely. And I think about all the time, like how much more difficult this would be to navigate if I was a mother. And I'm like so grateful for the fact that that was not a decision that I decided to make in my marriage because 
even after a divorce, unfortunately, when you got to co-parent with somebody, it's just another level and you're having to deal with this person that now you have this not so great potential relationship with, and you're going to have to deal with them for the next God knows how long, just as a result of the fact that you're parents. So I think for me, subconsciously, I always knew like this person would not be a good partner like to raise kids with. And that's one of the reasons why I decided not to have kids. Is that something that you guys were like talking about at any point? Or is that something like you were like, nah, that's not on my list of things to do? When we first met and got engaged, we didn't want to have kids. And then I think we started thinking we want to have a family. We want the end result, but we just don't want to make babies. So I think we were starting to sort of think about it and we went back and forth a lot and nothing was ever decided or finalized. And then obviously when things started feeling really off to me, I wasn't going to go forward with something like that. There are two things that I kept reminding myself that I'm extremely grateful for going through it, even when I was just depressed as hell. <laughs> and number one was that I didn't have kids, thank God. And then number two and this was hard for me to see at the time because when you're that depressed and going through that kind of upheaval, it's hard to have hope. I've never felt more hopeless and more helpless ever in my life. Mm -hmm. And all I could focus on was the negative. He's going to take my business and blah, blah, blah. And he's hurting my feelings all the time. One thing that helped me is I was on the phone with my parents one night maybe two nights before my mediation. And I was so stressed out. I was so anxious because I wanted to fight for myself and I wanted to get what was fair. And my dad helped remind me, like, he can't hurt you anymore. Mm. And my dad was like, he's already lost. He can't hurt you. You are going to win in the long run, no matter what. And I realized I was like, he could take everything I have. He could take my business and he could dwindle our estate down to zero. But at the end of the day, he can't take away my knowledge and my ambition and my drive and my experience. And I knew I would build it all back and more. Mm -hmm. And that's what finally kept me going is once I got to that mindset. And and thank God, because it's very, very true. And now I see that that is very true. Mm, that just gave me goosebumps because it's so true. Like when you're going through it, it's almost like you forget how much of a badass you are because the mental health told that this whole process takes on you is wild. And one thing that I'm super grateful for is that it reminded me how amazing my circle is. Like people rallied and it's such an important reminder to anybody who's like going through shit, whether it's a divorce or just anything, like you are not alone. There are people waiting to support you, but you have to first be able to like ask for the support and then also like accept it. Because I'm a super hyper independent person and I don't like asking anybody for shit. And people literally were like, I know you're not going to ask me to come and visit you. So I'm just going to let you know that I'm going to come and spend the day with you. I'm going to bring my laptop. I'm going to work from home with you so that you're not there alone. And sometimes you need to be reminded because I think especially when we're in these situations where it can feel like nobody knows what's going on it can really make you believe that you're alone and you're not. I agree with all that, Janice. And to your point, I started realizing I was really struggling and I was like, it was just not good. And my therapist was like, well, do your friends and family know you're struggling this much? And I was like, well, I don't know. She was like, did you tell them? And I was like, no. So <laughs> it was so hard because I think you and I are similar. You know, We're confident and we're strong and we don't just naturally turn to people for help. And a lot of women are like that. And so I finally had to just let them see what was happening, let them know how I was feeling. And I, I literally had to be like, I need help and I need support right now. Once I said that, they would check on me every day. My dad would send me like videos or song lyrics. And, and it didn't even matter if it's something that resonated or not. Just knowing that they were thinking about me, that was all I needed. I'm really glad I finally got to that point. And you just can't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah, absolutely. As an author, I'm curious as to how divorce impacts your intellectual property, if at all, because I've read things that like, you know, book royalties and that sort of thing can be also subject to a divorce. And I'm curious what your experience has been with that. Yeah. And they technically were, it was all included in my business valuation. So the business valuation accounted for book royalties, programs, all the different streams of income that I had through my business. And they put a valuation on that. And that's what I ended up having to buy them out 30 or 40%. So it was subject to the divorce and it was all accounted for. Got it. Okay. So basically it's like a one-time payment and then there's no ongoing like responsibility or whatnot. Yes. Luckily for me. Now every divorce can be different. There's things like alimony and maintenance mm -hmm. and that didn't come into account for me. 
It was just the business valuation. It was an asset. And then that was it. And I'm curious for you, Janice, like, what do you think is the biggest thing you've learned from your divorce or about yourself through this process? Ooh, I learned that I have an anxious attachment style, which is this new concept to me. I started becoming hyper aware of it once I started dating again and just like making these new relationships with people mean so much with like no effort. And I realized just like I have this really unhealthy attachment style and it can lead to me meeting people very much like my ex-husband, folks who are hella avoidant, who are potentially narcissistic who were just not really great for my mental health. And it's something that I needed to learn about myself because we met so young that I really didn't know who the hell I was. Like I was 20 years old when we first met and we were together for like 16 years. It's almost like I'm rediscovering who I am as a woman, what my values are, what kind of personality I need in my life, like the shit that I'm willing to accept, not accept. I'm just coming from like a place of really understanding myself in a way that I don't think I had that understanding back in the day. And as a public figure and as someone who is an entrepreneur, a financially independent woman, I have so much more like scrutiny now for the people that I allow in my space because of what I've built. I even have an alias, y'all. Like I don't use my real name on dating apps because I don't even want people to like be able to Google me until you've like earned the right to fucking know who I am at this point. <laughs> and it's just a weird place to be because it's very unique what we do. We have these platforms. We have these public facing businesses and you can't let everybody get close to this shit because there's a lot of like predators out there too. So I think I'm just like hella cautious, not in a way that like, oh my God, I don't want to be with nobody. It's like, it's a fucking privilege to know me at this point. That's how I'm carrying myself. And I hope you are too. <laughs> Hell yes, girl. I love that. Good for you. I feel like you got to that conclusion so much faster than I did. So I'm proud of you for that. How has dating been for you? Like when oh, did God, you start? <laughs> So bad for my mental health. I understand why people are just like, I'm staying inside and I'm just going to drink wine and watch Netflix because these men out here are wild. So you know what we got to do is I've dated in a few cities now because I travel so much. Now what we need to do is date in other countries because I went on a couple dates in <laughs> Colombia and that was great. And that was a good sort of cultural change. So I'll take one for the team. I'll find the best country to date men <laughs> if I need to. <laughs> we need uh, dating apps for entrepreneurs and we need dating apps for digital nomads. So anybody out there who's in the tech world, please, because Bumble Hinge, and Tinder are just not cutting it for me. But I will agree with you that dating in Puerto Rico was much more fun than it is here in America. Like I think mm. Puerto Rico has ruined these American men for me. So I'm just going to put that out there. Maybe it's a cultural thing. I think if you're Puerto Rican, hit up Denise. <laughs> <laughs> I already know. I have a specific It's been interesting dating at this phase of my life. I'm not taking it super seriously because at this point, I'm like, the last thing I need is to get caught up in some bullshit. I'm enjoying my freedom. I think we're in such privileged positions as women in this day and age to like not need a partner for financial security. That is fucking powerful because I know so many women in previous generations of my family stayed married, stayed in toxic relationships because they needed the financial support. They needed the financial security and it came at a lot of different costs, whether that was domestic violence or just like serial cheating, you know, finding out that like your husband has kids with the woman down the block and stuff. And it's like, we don't need to accept shit like that anymore. As a result, the men are going to have to step it up because we're not tolerating that shit. <laughs> That's right. I saw this Instagram reel that helped me a lot and I'll never forget it. And this guy was talking about marriages and relationships and stuff. And he was like, women, if he is not adding to your life, he is subtracting from it. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm only going to get into a relationship now if it improves my life. And right now I freaking love my life. And I never thought I would say that when I was in the middle of my divorce, but I love my life. I'm like traveling all over. I'm in Curacao right now, first of all. Oh, God, Traveling, girl. Your goals. I'm traveling all over and I make a ton of money and I, I'm fit and I work out and I'm active and I think I'm a cool person. And I'm not going to give any of that up to get mm. into another relationship now. I felt like I had to give things up when I was in my marriage. Like that's not going to happen anymore. And the decision I had to make 
was, would you rather be single for the rest of your life or in an unhappy marriage for the rest of your life? And that's what helped me actually come to the conclusion of getting a divorce. I was like, I'd rather be single. I'm freaking happy single now, finally. Yes, girl, I'm here for it. And, you know, I think this is such an important conversation that we're having because there's so much value that society places on us as women being like serving others, whether that's as a wife or a mother or family member or a coworker or whatever. And it's just like, yo, can we get back to actually prioritizing ourselves? Can we actually get back to a place where like, it's not selfish for a woman to leave a toxic marriage, where it's not selfish for a woman to choose to work on a career that she's passionate about, even though if that means longer hours because she's fulfilling her fucking purpose in life. It's not selfish for somebody, a woman to like decide not to become a mother because that's just not aligned with what her values are. Like, fuck that. You know, there have been so many women who fought for the opportunities and the privileges that we now get to exercise. And we should be hella unapologetic about exercising all of those rights and privileges. Yeah. I mean, life is too short to not be absolutely in love with yourself and the way your life is going. I won't accept anything less than that now. Yeah. So I'm curious what's next for you. So you're out here living your best life as a digital nomad. Do you see yourself like actually settling down, picking a place and putting your head down and building the next phase of your empire? It's hard to imagine settling down, but I am under contract on a duplex in Denver. And so I'm excited about that. It's just because I do spend a lot of time in Colorado. So when I'm back and forth, I'll just have my own place now instead of Airbnbs. I want to write more books. I want to build back up my real estate portfolio this year. I want to keep traveling. There's a lot of stuff that's planned. I'm just super excited. So that's what is next for me. What about you? For me, it's finishing my book manuscript, having my first live event in Puerto Rico, and embracing this new phase of freedom in my life. So I've talked to some folks about this, but I'm 95% sure I'm actually going to relocate to Puerto Rico by the end of this year. I have every opportunity to literally curate the life that I want. And so I'm kind of done waiting around and for the right time because there's really no right time. Yeah, that is amazing. I'm so excited for you. Yeah. (laughs) This has been such an incredible conversation. Before I let you go, Rachel, I want to know what's one thing that you would tell a woman who is like right there, maybe at the cusp of a divorce or she knows like it's time to move on but the fear of the unknown is keeping her stuck. What would you tell her? I would just encourage her to do what is best for her. And probably you know that deep down. It's just hard to consciously admit that. I'll say another thing that's not going to be very happy, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. Go to therapy, lean on your family and friends. And what happens afterwards and once you start feeling better is a life that you never could have imagined is possible. And I'm living it now and you will be there someday too. I love that advice. And I think I would also add, like, if you know that it's time to go, start putting things in place from a financial perspective, potentially, like start putting away some money, go open up a credit card that they don't necessarily know about, like start living that version of independence that you're wanting to lean into, like just make the decision. Because I know for me, subconsciously, I was planning my exit, even though I had not made the final decision. And then when it was time to pull the plug, I was already in a good position to be able to do that. So when you know, you know, just start acting accordingly. Yeah. Great advice. (laughs) Uh, Rachel, this has been an incredible conversation. I'm going to make sure to link all of your assets in the episode show notes so that folks can continue to follow your journey, be inspired by it. And I want to say thank you on behalf of the women who follow both of our incredible communities. I appreciate so much when people share the real fucking deal about what's going on in life. And yes, divorce is trash. Zero out of 10, do not recommend But there's always lessons that we can share from the experiences that we have. And I know your community appreciates your transparency. I've seen the love that you've received from just really showing folks like, hey, I'm human. This is what I'm going through. And these are the lessons that I want you to learn so that you don't find yourself in this position. And I've tried to do the same with my community as well. And I want to encourage you, whether you're a content creator or not, share what you're going through because you will be surprised how many people will just be inspired and motivated by your story just by like being human because we're out here living life and shit's going to happen. And the more that we can share our experiences, 
and hopefully leave somebody with some piece of information that's going to help them navigate the experience that is life, the better we are, better off we are. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me on. I really enjoyed this and I'm really proud of you and I'm proud of both of us. Thank you. High five to you, girl. We did it. (laughs) Thank you so much for being here. (laughs) Thank you.